What's a citizen? It's believing in something and doing something about it, being responsible and following through on promises. We're a company of 135,000 citizens. And we have a plan to work toward a greater good, a better future to share, one that will move us all forward. Citizen Verizon, our plan for economic, environmental, and social advancement. Thank you very much for joining us now for this important and I think really unique environmental panel. Our panelists are Catherine Coleman Flowers, who has a very long resume, but basically she spent her life working for equal access for water and sanitation for people in rural areas. And Chia Bastida, uh, an 18-year-old climate justice activist from New York City, but a native of Mexico. And uh, as we were talking before we began, a member of the Toltec people. So let, let's start with a kind of an opening question. Catherine, when we talk about climate change, we think so much about uh, greenhouse gas emissions and how great they are in uh, urban areas. One of my causes in New York is the built environment because when President Biden leaves office, 98% of the buildings in America will have been standing when he took office. And they still produce a lot of burdens on the rest of society because they're not as energy efficient as they ought to be. But you spent your life focusing on rural areas. For 12 years, I was governor of Arkansas. And when I took office, we had an enormous number of small communities, most of them majority black, who had no access to water and sewer. And I saw it. I, I went to those places. Nobody else had ever paid any attention to them. And they were sick babies every day because of the stuff they were ingesting. So talk a little bit about how you think we should approach this climate challenge in rural areas and how the communities you work with are affected. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. I've, I've been a long time admirer and, I, and one of the tactics that I use when I, uh, there are two things that I, that I do that I think that uh, you did quite well uh, as president. One was being able to go into those communities and for people to see firsthand, uh, especially policymakers to see firsthand the impact that are happening in rural communities because a lot of people don't even spend that kind of time in rural communities, yet they're trying to make policy that to address issues there. And then second, uh, storytelling, you know, lifting up examples that I've actually seen myself to tell the story in terms of the impacts. We've seen impacts recently. I mean, in, in a, a week ago, we had 14 tornadoes in this area and most of them touched down in rural communities. And not only were mobile homes impacted by it, this is 14 in one afternoon. Not only were mobile homes impacted by it, but still stick built homes were impacted by it as well. The other problems we've seen as it relates to climate change, uh, we're seeing water tables uh, rising because of sea level rise in Lowndes County, for an example. Uh, I, in my book, Waste, I wrote about Pamela Rush and we tried to move her from the mobile home that she was living in, but she couldn't move because what held us up was on the half acre property that she owned out in the country. The septic system that she would, would have needed would have cost $28,000 because if you went down 25 inches, you would have struck water because of the high water tables. They're going to continue to rise. In places like Alaska, there's melting permafrost that's destroying uh, infrastructure where there was infrastructure. And we have a lot of places where people don't have infrastructure at all. And what it does is exposes them if they don't have clean water, if they don't have sanitation. We did a study back in, that was published in 2017 
where we found tropical parasites, including hookworm, in people in Lowndes County. And I think that we're going to find as time goes on that this is not just an Alabama problem. This is a problem throughout the United States, and we know definitely around the world. And as climate change uh, becomes more of a problem than it is right now, we're going to see a greater impact on the environmental justice community, especially in rural areas. Thank you for mentioning that. And uh, I can go to Shia now because of uh, part of what you mentioned about Alaska, because native peoples in Alaska are being hurt worse than anybody else by the melting of the permafrost. And uh, when Hillary was a senator, she went to Alaska and to Point Barrow, which is the northernmost inhabited village uh, in the United States and talk to the native people about how their lives have been dramatically altered. And this was more than 15 years ago since they were telling her, you know, we're never going to recover from this. It's we've lived this way for 2000 years. And now we're being asked to do something that we don't have the tools to deal with. Shia, you talk about how uh, indigenous philosophy informs a lot of your approach to climate justice, and you've been very active, uh, not only in America, but around the world in trying to mobilize young people to demand it. Uh, how did your upbringing and your roots in your Toltec culture affect the way you saw this? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. And it's something that I usually speak on because, you know, being raised um, as I was by my dad, who is part of the Ottoman Toltec community, um, you know, he raised me with this philosophy of reciprocity to Mother Earth. So um, indigenous people's philosophy is to take care of everything around us because we know that Mother Earth takes care of us. Um, so that practice of living with the earth rather than from it has really guided my activism and is something that uh, indigenous peoples around the world um, you know, preach and take uh, and make sure that that that's one of the guiding principles in our work. And um, when we talk about the climate crisis, we see that you know the climate crisis is basically all of these systems that are disrespecting Mother Earth. So when I was growing up and I started to see that people were profiting off of extraction and pollution, um, I realized that you know, people didn't see the world the way that I did. So that's when my bubble burst as a little kid who was growing up and learning about the world. Uh, I saw that there were companies coming into my town and transnational companies coming into my town trying to build really invasive infrastructure that wasn't taking care of the land and wasn't taking care of what indigenous peoples had to say about it. Um, so I think that's why, you know, centering this philosophy is so important in the climate movement because we cannot get to where we want to be with the same practices that have gotten us there. So it's very important that we have this, um, you know, lens of reciprocity, lens of taking care of Mother Earth in the climate movement. I think it's a very good thing that the new Secretary of the Interior uh, is the first Native American woman ever to hold that job. Because uh, one of the things I learned kind of almost after I became president because we didn't have much interior department land in my native state, was how by simply honoring the values of uh, America's native peoples, we will become better environmental stewards and basically help to restrain the growth of harmful emissions into the atmosphere simply by saving the land. And one of the big fights that uh, caused me particular pain over the last uh, four years was when the previous administration took all the land out of the Grand Staircase and Escalante and Bears Cloth National Monuments that President Obama and I had established because it meant that more and more people would be forced to live in ways that not only contradicted their own values, but compromised the future of all of us. And you must have lots of examples of that. Um, Catherine, uh, 
John Lewis died a few months ago, and he was a friend of mine for more than 30 years, and he sponsored the first environmental justice legislation in the Congress. And thanks to his inspiration, we closed three times as many toxic waste dumps in my first four years as has been closed in the previous 12. But still, race is the number one indicator for the placement of toxic facilities in the U.S. In New York, a few years ago, in the poorest congressional district in the country, in the Bronx, uh, they were receiving massive bunches of waste from every place else. And there was a real controversy about how to most safely dispose of it in a way that would create a different climate instead of exacerbate it. So since Black Americans are 75% more likely to live near facilities that produce hazardous water. Uh, how should we think about, the thing that I like about your career is that you have placed immediate personal health in the context of environmental justice. And it turns out that dealing with the longer term effects of climate change, uh, it becomes easier if you do what's right for people's health today. So talk a little about that. Yes, uh, thank you. Well, first of all, uh, one of the areas that we can look to for an example of what happens when we do it wrong is Cancer Alley. Uh, Cancer Alley is located between New Orleans and Baton Rouge in Louisiana in the southern part of the United States. And what in there, my visit to Cancer Alley, my visits, I've actually seen it's like the intersectionality between uh, environmental justice and also climate justice because Cancer Alley is right there along the Mississippi River. And you can see the river is actually up higher than the land that's around. You can see the plantations as you drive through the area and actually see the people living close to these polluting plants that are transnational plants that we know that it's just a matter of time if there's ever an explosion or a leak or whatever, the community can suffer even more. That's one example in terms of the health effects because they have some of the highest cancer rates in the US. Another example in terms of environmental justice, one that's happening in real time is in West Memphis uh, with the Bahalia pipeline, which is being brought through an area that was a freedman's town and the possibility that there's a leak the one thousand, they said a 1% chance of leaking, but that 1% is too much because it would leak into an aquifer that called, that create, that provides clean drinking water for people, uh, over a million people. But, but what happens in these instances is that the health of the individuals that are living in these areas is never considered. And as a result, I think what we've done, we have to shift that paradigm away from putting uh, profit over people and profit over health. And one of the things that has exacerbated, I think, uh, the, that kind of paradigm, we see that magnified with COVID. And, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later, but that is just one example of how the health of people that are impacted have been impacted even greater by COVID because it has been compromised because of these decisions that have been made to put these contaminating, polluting plants in these communities. And as you know, uh, for years, America suffered not only in Cancer Alley, but most intensely in Cancer Alley, but from the pollution of the Mississippi River. And if you go to the mouth of the Mississippi into the Gulf of Mexico, there's a dead zone in the Gulf about the size of the state of New Jersey where nothing can live because of the pollution. And it's important to remember that before all that stuff got down there, a lot of it, it was in exposure to human beings who were living on the land and got the cancers and other conditions that you discussed. Um, well, that I'll just lead that into something that I know that she has been concerned about. How do you think these the existing inequalities in our society anyway, which you have made a point of talking about, are exacerbated by climate change. And how can including 
marginalized voices in the environmental justice movement change that? Well, I think that when we think about the climate crisis and climate change, we don't really think about the global effects that it's going to have. Maybe we think about waters rising and how that may affect coastal cities or uh, wildfires and how that is affecting um, you know, communities around the world. But there is also uh, many other things that happen when there is um, you know, a lot of intersectional issues that we have to focus on. One of the issues is uh, climate refugees. When we have more flooding, more drought, more fires, this is going to cause a wave of climate refugees that is going to create, you know, international instability. Um, another issue is with a water crisis, uh, women in communities where it's a culture to go and collect uh, water makes women, women more vulnerable to, to different uh, dangers. Uh, you know, pollution, how, you know, several countries, including the U.S., produces over 250 billion tons of, of trash. And we put that trash, you know, that trash never really gets thrown away. We just move it out of our sight and it ends up in poor Southeast Asian communities, um, impacting people's livelihoods. So I think that when we think about the climate crisis, we need to see it as not only what the causes are, but also all of the repercussions that it may have. And having uh, people from these communities, stakeholders from these communities representing at high level forums like COP, like, you know, um, and the federal government is going to help us, uh, you know, internalize these intersectionalities and be able to have holistic solutions. What should be done with all this waste? How should it be disposed of? Well, you know, only 9% of plastic gets recycled. So the answer is don't create that waste in the first place. Right. So right now, with all the waste that we have, we can find ways of incorporating it in the different buildings that we build or, you know, um, kind of trying to tuck it away. Um, but the answer is really stop producing all this waste. We have to learn to live a more low waste lifestyle and not make it expensive, not making it elitist to do that, making it accessible to people, uh, making it so that everyone feels comfortable um, and you know, just living a life that doesn't affect our, our mother earth. So I think that, that that's what systemic change means. And that's what we want to bring about. That's one thing I think that uh, grassroots citizens efforts can have an impact on. 100%. People should stop buying it. Uh, almost all the stores in this little community where Hillary and I live now, this, they won't give you plastic bags. You know, that, and, uh, they may even charge you for a paper bag, but at least you get a paper bag and one that can be easily recycled. So I, I think that's important. And that's something that young people can advocate for in every community, every community in every neighborhood in New York City, everybody can do that. Um, what about, Catherine, what about the wastewater infrastructure and well, I, i've been you know this affects urban and rural areas in different ways mm -hmm. a lot of urban areas i'm worried about this in new york by the way a lot of urban areas new york has the best city water in america with the least chemicals in it because of a system that was built a long time ago but the pipes through which it is carried are old and creaky and i'm worried about that but there are so many places in America where both the drinking water and the wastewater and the waste generally are not safely disposed of. They are provided for. They're, they're just, it's like these places, it's like they don't exist when it comes to the basic amenities of having a healthy life. So tell us what you're doing about it and what we should do. Yes, thank you. Um, but that's, that has become my life's work is to, figured out this issue because I grew up in rural Lowndes County, Alabama, which is between Selma and Montgomery. And, uh, you know, I love the idea of being a country girl. But when I went back home and I saw the some of the conditions that existed when I grew up, I mean, the only change, difference was instead of having outhouses, people had toilets in the homes. But when they flushed the toilet, they went out on top of the ground. We didn't have that problem with the outhouse. And that is a, a, a basic problem that we found throughout a lot of rural communities where people just don't have wastewater infrastructure at all. And those that do have wastewater infrastructure, like on-site septic systems, a lot of them are failing. A lot of them are failing because of climate change. 
and we have to come up with new ways of treating this technology. Uh, the other problem that I, I found even recently, there was an example, I was in a meeting uh, in a town where uh, when the when the lines were drawn for the town and they built the wastewater treatment facility, it was not built for black people. And when we were having a discussion because of one of the city council persons was concerned that the people in her district were still on on-site septic and these on-site septic systems were failing. But the people running the water and sewer system basically said uh, when the communities were built, the communities were built without sewer and we're not putting sewer there. It, it should have been the responsibility of the developers. Is that kind of attitude to me that's like another monument to the Confederacy. It creates these obstacles that keep the keep sanitation equality from, from happening because these are people that are putting their personal preferences over the public health and the health of people in those communities. And the way we're trying to deal with it, uh, besides talking with policymakers and exposing them to the problem and proposing solutions on the policy level, we're also going to partner and actually move to a part of Alabama that has more um, has more scientists and engineers than anybody else in the state. And we're going to bring together people that are actually suffering from the failures along with engineers and scientists and using the, some of the technology that NASA uses to see if we can come up with a new way to treat wastewater and to change that paradigm that is more uh, in communion with Mother Earth where we re we recycle and reuse because some of it can be recycled and be reused as opposed to dumping it into our lakes and streams and creating algae blooms and fish kill. You know, I live in a very old area of New York. It's about 20 miles north of New York City. And while it has a lot of wealthy residents, there are also an enormous number of immigrants here. And it has a lot to recommend it. It's got the highest amount of green space per person of any uh, urban county in America. But there are a lot of people who aren't on water systems and that have septic tanks. But we have very high regulations, so it's fine. I came here and I brought the Secret Service in, so I immediately we double the size of the septic system I have it checked on a regular basis. We check the water. I, re I re replaced the septic field, but it's the first time in 40 years that it had been replaced. Now, if upper income people are endangering the environment, you can imagine the burden it puts on all these poor people who live in the county and live in rental housing and are just at the mercy of whatever happens. And I, I think that, and in rural America, it's more invisible where people just do not pay attention. They have no earthly idea how many people live out there in, in unsafe environments. We saw a lot of attention played, thank God, to the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, and it led it to people to look at the water crisis in other communities, but still almost no recognition that this was normal day-to-day -day stuff for people in rural America and uh, heavily uh, racially differentiated. So I think, I hope that both that you and you too, Shia, when, when the Congress is going to take up an infrastructure uh, bill, now that the, uh, the economic bill is passed. And uh, some places have gotten funds out of this bill that just passed, some state and local governments that can be used for environmental funding. And I think there needs to be a great grassroots effort made to make sure that people understand that in at, certainly in rural America and some of the oldest parts of urban America, you can't have racial justice or public health or environmental justice unless any kind of infrastructure program is about building safe water, safe sewer systems, and producing less waste in the first place. I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. And I'd like to take it a little step further. Um, 
well, I, I'm actually talking to some people that are working on legislation around that, and, and especially the infrastructure legislation and how to deal with it. But one of the things that I found that was quite appalling is that we start asking the question, what happens what happens when you put in place these on-site septic systems and they fail within two years because that's what's happening in this area? And we were told by people from the industry that they don't want to give a warranty. And, I, and that's one of the things that we're pushing for from the grassroots because I think the difference is the type of system that will probably be sold to them will be the cheapest, most likely to break down in the first place. And I don't want people running into poor communities around the country or rural communities around the country because they feel that they're not close to a media, major media market, spending the money and walking away with no liability, no accountability. And at some point, when it comes to building infrastructure, especially the infrastructure that we use out in rural communities, there should be some accountability associated with that. And that's something else that we're pushing for as well. And I think that should happen whether it's roads and bridges, or, or, or whether we're talking about waste or sanitation, because we can see what happens when people don't pay attention. That's why we had Flint. Flint wasn't because there was no infrastructure. It was because of poor infrastructure and going through those pipes with that, that type of water, which they shouldn't have been using for people to drink in the first place. But the fact that it had those chemicals in there and lifted that metal out of those, those pipes and, and took the lead into the house, it made it worse. And we need to make sure, I think that the kind of, Emphasis we put into uh, dealing with uh, making a COVID vaccine, let's make wastewater sanitation a priority too and build that kind of infrastructure where that will last, at least the septic system should last as long as the mortgage on the house and come with a service warranty as well. Because otherwise, people in rural communities are left behind over and over and over again once the money and the attention is gone. Well, I agree. You know, it's going to take some money the federal government's going to have to fund it or they're going to have to give grants to the states and they can fund it but i remember when jimmy carter was president because like me he'd gone up in a rural area and had actually lived on a farm they uh the government used to give us these small grants uh, and they give a chunk of them to the states and i spent all mine on water and sewer in tiny rural areas and I just gave it to people. And nobody had ever helped them before. You can't expect people to make, uh, you know, something out of nothing. And it's it was it's not expensive. It's not nearly as costly as paying for the horrible health care bills, losing the productivity of people, shortening their lives, stunning their children. And it, so, anyway, I, I think you guys should really drive to get that in to the, any kind of climate bill that comes out, any kind of infrastructure bill, to pretend that this is not an infrastructure issue is crazy. I love it when my neighbors up here gripe, and I do too sometimes, about, oh, we have so much vigorous local government, it takes forever to get a decision and everything, but thank God we've got engineers that come out and measure the quality of our water, the safety of our soil, and, and make sure that this stuff happens. And it is worth paying for. And those of us who can afford to pay for it should pay for it for everybody in America. It's really important. Uh, she had talked just a little bit about what you're doing to mobilize other young people to reimagine all this and to be active. I, I really think, I, I, I know I sound like a broken record, but I think we need Lots of every young person I know is a natural environmentalist. They get it. Their intuitive instinct is to protect the environment. And I think that in addition to being a, a national political force and a global force like Greta Thunberg, is, I think we also need people at every city council meeting, at every county meeting, and every we need we need to flood people with the faces of young, expectant people with their whole lives before them, and they need to face the consequences of what they do or don't do. And how, how can you do that? Tell us what you're trying to do about that. Oh, uh, yeah, for sure. So, you know, um, as youth, I think that we might not have taught how to be empowered in 
like politically. So when I first started uh, my activism, I started in my environmental club in my school. And I saw that we had so much more potential. So I started testifying at City Hall in New York City, going up to Albany to support bills. And this is when you realize that, you know, movements have been led by youth. Movements have been, uh, you know, championed by youth. And we need to bring that um, community power, people power, not only into our local communities, but, you know, the federal government and international conferences. Because uh, with the climate crisis, with something as a climate crisis, we have a deadline and it's going to affect my grandchildren and their grandchildren more than it is going to affect any one of us who's living um, on this earth today. So that's why it's so important for us to support all types of policy uh, and sometimes disrupt the system when we're not being listened to, which is why we strike. Uh, but our overall goal is to, you know, make people pay attention and push uh, the most policy, climate policy we can forward. We're about out of time, but is there any other point either one of you want to make? Anything we haven't said that you'd like to be on record on? Well, there's one thing I would like to say, since, especially since we're talking to young people, I'd like to make an appeal to young people that are listening to um, and will be a part of, of this this forum to to reach out to us that are interested. We're interested in partnerships and 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 helping to solve this wastewater problem, not just here in the United States, but around the world. And we're trying to document it. And the way in which we can document it is for young people to help us do that. And, and then they can also be part of sitting at the table and reimagining what sanitation equity looks like and how do we get there. Yeah, and the last thing I would add is, you know, be a stubborn optimist in the climate uh, movement because you know, that means that the climate crisis is our greatest challenge, the greatest challenge we've ever faced, but it's also our greatest opportunity to come together, our greatest opportunity to show the world our skills, uh, our greatest opportunity to choose what you're good at and do it through a climate lens. Because, you know, as Catherine pointed out, the most important thing is a good foundation. And we're trying to build the foundation of the climate movement so that we can grow stronger and, you know, forward together. Well, I think that's a message that can apply to every country uh, represented on this Zoom. You know, we have even countries that aren't democracies have leaders that have to be responsive when people get sick and die and have their futures robbed for them. And uh, I remember being so struck about uh, India, which is so gifted with entrepreneurs and technological advances but all the gains are concentrated on about 35% of the people and 65% of the people there still, most of them don't have the things you're fighting for here, Catherine. Uh, in China, which has more money than anybody and in, built a road in East Africa and is providing uh, its vaccines to poor countries, that's all good, but there have, in their country, more than 40 million acres of land is so polluted by chemicals and unregulated waste that they have to go to other countries to buy food and they're trying to buy other countries farmland, which I personally believe is a mistake. Uh, so this is a global issue. And if we're gonna accommodate this, we have to face it. Uh, I also would like to point out that that almost every wealthy country and a lot of middle income and lower income countries now have falling birth rates. And ordinarily you might say, well, that's a good thing. It's less environmental pollution. But if it's a woman exercising her right to stay in school and go to work, that's one thing. But if it is catapultingly diminishing fertility rates because of exposure to chemicals, that's not a good thing. It, it's not a good thing to think uh, that you would grow up in a society where people who love each other wouldn't be able to have children because of their exposure to chemicals early. So this whole thing is really, we're gonna have to decide as citizens of our com smallest community, our nations, and the larger world, 
whether we are going to live according to our basic values or our fundamental, most fundamental life choices are going to be shaped by people who were taking the easy way out for short-term gain. And it's just not worth it. We, we are interconnected. The, the great, uh, I remember when I was trying to save the old growth forest in the Pacific Northwest as president, we exempted the Native American tribes from the rules we imposed on the loggers and in the privately owned land or the, or the federally owned land. And people ask me why. And I said, because they cut one tree every seven generations. They, their ethic was to save and nourish the earth. The very thing you said when we started this program. So I thank you for this because most of us, we just talk about how to do more solar and wind. And I, I love that. I'm heavily involved in both uh, how to do, you know, more geothermal energy, but the stuff we produce both from our bodies and from our work and don't take care of properly is staggering. And it ought to be part of this climate change conversation and climate justice should be at the heart of it. And thanks to people like you, it will be. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. Thank you.